port and starboard motors, main breakers. Yeah. And the size of this box is more determined by code than anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, what you'll notice from the boat you're working on, this is actually two engines back to back, double the size of what you're working on. Mm -hmm. Here's our major cooling device to keep this engine cool when it's flat out. Now, nice, is that, is that nice circulate water through there? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Is that your phone? Straight through. Uh, now, where Dave, I thought, did brilliantly with this, the, foot, the, the motor is a one foot diameter of rotor, so it's the prop. It's, it, it's just this one to one balance. The, the, the motor spins at about, flat out at about 750, 780 RPM. No need for a gearbox, another thing that doesn't need to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, oddly enough, if you've got a diesel, then you've got to start your diesel. Your diesel's got to build up into its torque band, which is going to be typically up around 2000 RPM, mm -hmm. before you are then able to get full torque mm -hmm. out of your engine and move your boat. Well, oddly enough, this chap here decides he likes to have full torque at zero RPM. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of bully the boat around a bit in that sitting from nothing. If you want to shove this boat forward, poof, and you can feel the boat lurch forward, unlike uh, a diesel drive, you'll just sort of feel it slowly try to catch up. Uh, so a lot more responsive than diesels. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the previous owner had made the mistake of boasting that this drive's so strong you can stop the boat from flat out in less than a boat length. And just to demonstrate it, yes. he did it. There well, will be. he blew the shear pins in the drive, right here. <laughs> uh, the, the, the engine wasn't concerned at all that he did that. <laughs> the prop wasn't concerned, but the shear pin was. <laughs> So, uh, but yes, he was able to stop the boat from flat out in less than one boat length. Uh, and only blew, to, uh, the yeah. anecdotal story I heard was only blew one shear pin. Yeah, only one. Yeah, but um, very maneuverable, very responsive. I, in fact, uh, when I was down in Tortola and came over to uh, St. Thomas pulling into Red Hook, it was blowing about 20 knots straight up the channel. And the... Uh, Dock master had indicated go to this particular slip. Now it was a, a slip just inside the end, so we came cruising straight in. Wind right up behind us. Pulled into the slip, tied off, and go looking for the electrical connection. Well, it's around the dock on the wrong side. It means I needed to pull the boat out of the slip, turn it around, put it back mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with Red Hook, there's a bar up top, about three stories, up on top of a building and where I was parked I was surrounded there was about five uh, Norseman 447s another dozen catamarans sitting there and unbeknown to me all the owners were sitting up in the bar and uh, so in this 20 knots we decided oh well we'll just take the boat out spin it around and put it back in so that our shore power is now in the right spot yes well I didn't realize this until I put the boat back in but they were all running around the dock they thought I was suicidal because I had not come what any of them would have had to have done come out of that slip back into the fairway turned their boat round out in the fairway and then brought it back in the slip you run out of the slip spun it I, around, put it back in the slip in 20 knots of breeze i pulled out of the slip spun it round on itself very quickly mm -hmm. and put it back in the slip and they could not believe and they're like <laughs> How bigger engines have you got? <laughs> yeah, you've got oh, a horsepower. Two, 200 horsepower. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't muscle a normal cut and ran around no. like that. But, but the, like I say, that low speed, low power torque is just phenomenal, uh, particularly when you get into tight quarters in docking situations. Uh, so what do they say when you turned off your engine? Uh, well, I hadn't turned the generator on, so, so they, they just see had any electric. Engine. So <laughs> they came in and said, well, well, "Where's that's your the, engine?" Uh, I had that Where'd big electric motors? sign on the back, and that was the giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> had the sign not been there, I would have just said, "Well, boys, I'm just that good." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Full sailing stories. Have you? Okay, 
Oh, go ahead. No, okay, so you see, compared to the, the Kinex 38 that you're doing, two controllers. That's right. because mm -hmm. two motors. Mm -hmm. Call that redundancy unnecessary. Um, but so uh, each half of that motor is independent. E each, each so you could half lose has one its own controller and still be turning the other. That has happened to me. Yeah, I explained before where yeah. I was. I was in a shipyard and we had the back of the boat open for three months. Humidity got in, and I lost one controller on each side. Mm -hmm. Didn't stop the boat. No. Still kept running. Um, it's. Uh, it, I, I personally feel, you know, since this was the first boat done, uh, compared to how we use the boat, where I'm not interested in pushing the boat along at eight and a half knots, mm -hmm. I'm very content to go along at six, six and a half. Mm -hmm. I could have done with the half-size motor. Now, if I'd had the half-size motor, then I'd have less resistance or friction. Mm -hmm. Drag with the props. Right. I'd, ac I'd actually mm -hmm. produce more power than I currently do. Half. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. at the moment I'm produ you know, produce around a kilowatt over a kilowatt, kilowatt and a half. I think I could probably get up to you know two, two and a half kilowatts if I had the half size engine, six horsepower instead of the twelve. Well just take half of it off. Yeah, just put a coupling in <laughs> <laughs> with an electric clutch. Not, not quite that simple. But okay. you, but you, the advantage is, or what what he's saying is that our the yeah. Kinex is thirty eight. This is forty one, right. and it can easily be pushed with fifteen to twenty five amps, uh, just like this yes. one can, takes. Right. You know, yeah. that's his amp load. There's my Odyssey batteries. Now that that deck, including down the side here, used to be jammed with uh, Lifeline batteries, standard AGMs. Uh, been very happy with these. Yeah, you know, like I said, I dropped from two hundred and ten amp hour down to 126. Well here's the big secret. The Chevy Volt. Cobalt says who manufactures that battery, who happens to have, I think, a majority ownership by Chevron. Won't talk to anyone. So the Chevy Volt has a 144 volt uh, lithium ion nanophosphate battery bank that is totally self-managed. They said to put it in a car, you can be able to plug it in, walk away, pull it out and drive zero maintenance battery. So the charges are built into the battery bank. 30 kilowatt, my understanding is it's a 30 kilowatt battery. Half the size of this. I've got 17 kilowatts spread between the half a dozen batteries here and the half a dozen on the other side. So uh, if those batteries become available, yes, mm -hmm. I could reduce weight and put 60 kilowatts on. That's why I say yes. this is an emerging science. We're, we're getting bigger and better batteries. Now, what would that mean to me? It means that I could just run the air conditioning all night uh, without starting a generator. Yeah. So if you want to have a nice, quiet, peaceful night's sleep, there's your answer. But then again, go sailing. This, the this, energy. This, this will charge your battery bank. You know, one thing I noticed, Bruce, is that you have no insulation Don't need it. in your engine room compartment underneath the uh, uh, underneath the bed, Don't underneath the, yeah, the cabin. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's, there's nice. a bit. I mean, nice you know, there's some tie panels and stuff. But yeah. you've got to remember, this was the first boat. It was built, and they were about to pop some Yamahas in it. Uh, Yanmars, I mean. Mm -hmm. a and uh, all of a sudden, Dave Tether turns up and says, Oh, we'll just slip some electric drives in. And, yeah, so it was quite an education for the guys at the factory. But, yeah, some of the some of the soundproofing had been done. That's awesome. Now, there were, there were things that were done. Yeah, you know, they put these, these vents after... Uh, and you know that was done by the catamaran company. Dave's, Dave, Tether's opinion, not necessary. My opinion, absolutely not necessary. Uh, uh, but now, you know, because that that is a uh, watertight bulkhead there. So now I've got some hoses running through this watertight bulkhead. That's no longer watertight. That, that that didn't need them. Yeah, uh, it was the opinion of one of the mechanics. Uh, uh, at the catamaran company now uh, I, I don't know what testing he did but certainly in that climate down there he may have felt that was valid it could have been to do with humidity or something like that my preference air conditioned the space rather than mm -hmm. separately vented outside um, you know but uh, this is as Dave built it now there's a lot more cable in that location particularly over there 
plan is to do with this motor system. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all it's all to do with here's my main feeds coming onto the boat, back to the power panels, etc. Uh, hey Bruce, can we can thing. we talk to you about how you turn you know your different paneling structure and how you did for your switches and your chargers? Is there anything else you guys have as questions here in the engine room? Get him out of this hot little, hot little room. Okay. Is there anything else? No. Okay. Oh. oh. Well, I'm thinking. Nice light to switch on the battery. These ones cut the battery bank in half. You said your cutlass bearings are making some noise, whatever. It's not the cutlass, it's the strut bearing. Oh. And I just replaced them. And I squeak. What, what kind of a okay. strut bearing is you, it? You got the, you've got a strut bearing sitting back here right before the prop. We okay. call that cutlass. We call that a cutlass. Um, Bruce. On, on a cross charger, whether it's Victron or, or a PowerNet or one of the duplication of the systems that Dave has, yeah, uh, what is your? You had an opinion, and I really enjoyed it about the 144 volt DC to 12 volt instead of even needing to have the AC go to that at all. Yeah, I, it, it's it's part of the. I, I look at this and go, I've set this up so I can switch it to short power. What for? Mm -hmm. My 144 volt battery is being charged by the 144 volt charger. I could have left this with no switch on it and permanently left it so that my 12 volts is permanently coming off the 144 volts. I've got kilowatts of battery bank back there. Then I could change this out to a lawnmower battery. Yes. I only need a float battery because of startup loads, but this could have been my house battery. When people boast, I've got four or five hundred amp hours of house battery. Well, I, got a be, I, I got a motorcycle. I got a motorcycle battery. Motorcycle battery. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I've got several kilowatts of main bank, <laughs> but a motorcycle battery for a house battery. Yeah. Um, and you know, being a catamaran, being a little weight conscious, uh, that's why when this battery disappears, it will be a very small battery going back in. Here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I might pull that switch and just permanently leave the Victron. On the as, a, as a cross charger, it's, it's less wiring. Uh, if the only thing that I'm really worried about plugging in to 240, 240 volts is one battery charger, that's mm -hmm. it. Now, and that's part of where I said before about the isolation, I ended up putting in galvanic isolation it's because I had a very leaky steel boat beside me. And I figured I was getting some of the strange uh, stray EMF into, mm -hmm. into this boat. So I went ahead and installed the, the galvanic isolator, but if it hadn't been for the way the grounding system had been done on this boat, uh, uh, you know, which wasn't done with a consideration to the electric drive, um, I, I quite frankly would look at this and go, if this was the only device running, there would have been no need for isolation. So mm -hmm. you, know, you, you wouldn't have had anything else. This would have been connected to the shore power ground and that was that. And that was it. Yes, yeah. and there's nothing on that 144 volt battery bank that connects yeah. to. Mm -hmm. And we took that advice the on the on the Kinex where we yeah. brought it in with one 30 amp service. Yes. The 30 amp service will feed the 144 volt DC charger. Yep. And it will have a, a, a side note, we'll have a one a 20 amp receptacle there for work lights, things like that if you take right. the system offline. But that 144 volt charger will charge the battery bank. Then from the battery bank, the inverter, the DC to DC converter for 12 volt, everything yep. will come off of that. Yep. So you've got some uh, real simplistic design. Yes. Yeah. I, I and I've gone more and more in that direction where uh, this this AC side of the boat is becoming less and less complicated. Uh, but that's more from adopting and this view. More and more my battery of it bank is is just a giant UPS. Okay. And it's more from adopting that view, saying, okay, I want it to be self-managed. I like my generator turning on and off when it sees what the battery voltage is. So I walk on the boat, press the on button, walk away. Yeah. And if 20 minutes later... The if it starts, it needs it. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, But then when I'm sailing, I can keep it in such a mode that it doesn't need it. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've gone for more than 24 hours without the generator turning on still using everything, everything I need to, to sail the boat and the refrigerator and freezer and a ton of lights and all the nav equipment and you'll see I've got two Raymarines on here so there's eight amps straight up uh, yeah well let's let's go up and let's go up